but good good afternoon to everyone um thank you all for for finding the time and and visiting today's webinar uh my name is erki brackman i'm i'm the ceo of sky select and for those of you who who don't know sky select we are an e-procurement as a service platform uh, for aircraft material and and we help airlines mros to digitize and and automate material purchasing uh, for for leaner and more asset light uh, operations. Um, today we'll be we'll be discussing how to effectively leverage technology in the MRO supply chain. Um, but before before we get started, um, I will quickly go through uh, some points so that uh, we can all have a seamless webinar experience. Um, if you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the chat window. Uh, we'll address those during the Q and A session. And in case there are any technical issues uh, where we can actually help you as well, then uh, please uh, let us know and we'll, we'll try to resolve this as quickly as possible. And after the webinar, uh, every can everyone can watch this recording um, uh, on demand as well on, on our website. Now, um, let's get it started. Um, our today's speakers are uh, Ivan uh, Gonzalez Vallejo from Iberia. He is trained aerospace engineer uh, with masters in spacecraft design and business administration. He's been part of the executive committee of Iberia Maintenance for last six years. He is currently director of strategy and supply chain and also has held other positions uh, such as director of components, inventory and logistics and head of strategic planning and transformation. And previously, he worked um, as a stra uh, strategy and ma uh, management consultant um, for McKinsey and the company, as well as um, at IAG Group. So welcome, Ivan. <clears throat> Thank and, you very much. My pleasure. And our second speaker is Patrick Koval. Patrick was born in Rochester, New York, and he has uh, 37 years of experience in supply chain and aviation. He started his career in, um, in 1985, American Airlines. During his career, he has, he's worked uh, for companies such as Honeywell, American West, uh, West, West Airlines, uh, Jet Aviation, as well as IBM. And before joining SkyThread, where he is responsible for innovation and product development design currently, he was the managing director of TechOps um, supply chain at the United Airlines. Thank you, Patrick, for joining us today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. <laughs> Perfect. So let's get started. Um, we'll be covering four topics today. Um, you'll be able to see those um, in, a, uh, in a moment on the screen as well. And uh, we'll leave some time at the end uh, for a, for a Q&A as well. So let's jump into the first topic. Um, Ivan, um, from your perspective, what are the key challenges in the MRO supply chain? Well, I think, um, and, and whomever has been a bit uh, exposed to this over the last years, there's some tactical issues now. No? There's a lot about bottlenecks, there's a lot about crew logistics and issues moving things around. But uh, I would like to focus on, on, on more of the structural points. And, and, and for me, I see, I see two. One, is inflation costs uh, and now the world is worried about how year-on-year uh, -year pricing is uh, is increasing but in aviation we've seen this for the last couple of decades and and basically every 10 years uh, costs double up whilst the um, uh, revenues for airlines uh, go down two to three percent no uh, so how sustainable is this in future it, i think is worrisome and it's part of a uh, uh, and, the, and the supply chain, the thing is that I see, and this links to the second issue, is consolidating more and more. Uh, that was extremely consolidated on the on the engine side, but we're seeing that more as well on the components availability service side and, and also on the airframers. Um, leaving or, or, or supporting even the, to tackle revenues or the year year increase of revenues uh, very easily for, for the suppliers. Uh, and at the end, uh, especially, and we'll talk about this a bit later, where the situation of airlines living a very difficult situation. But I'm not sure if um, these suppliers in the market or these part, these, these partners, uh, are able to uh, to tackle 
um, the reduced costs that are needed for supply chain. So I would say consolidation uh, as is an issue, year and year increase is a, is a structural issue for the, for the next years, and also uh, very little alternatives. Um, uh, PMA DER, for instance, has been put as, a, as an alternative to uh, some of the OEM solutions, but yet still in very early stages and not a lot of courage from, from operators to jump in uh, to, to break the circle of, of inflationary pricing. Thank you, Ivan. Patrick, um, what do you want to add or how, what do you see on your side? Patrick, I think you're muted. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so, you know, this could easily be a, a you know, two-hour monologue talking about, you know, what the challenges are. But since since we're focused on technology, I think, you know, the, the key challenge <clears throat> that I see that has a, you know, a technological solution is really visible visibility and integrity of, of data and activity that are, that, you know, that are, that are out there right now. I mean, you can you can walk across a you know a vacant parking lot or a field with your eyes closed, um, but when things are changing and there's turns and cliffs to fall off of, you you got to be aware of things. And the and the things that you know the turns and the swings that a supplier are going to see are are going to be you know the the changes in demand from an airline. And and as Yvonne mentioned, you know there's a the risk of uh, in, inflation's already happening. But the risk of a recession is really a, a big deal, and and as we've seen with the with the pandemic, is that when something bad happens, you know, demand drops off, um, and and you know, when demand drops off, you know, the smaller suppliers let go of their people very quickly, uh, you know, as we saw in COVID, and, and a lot of them don't come back. So so that's a big issue, and and you know, the larger suppliers, the tier ones, they have inventory, and they can you know they could they can live through a little bit of that. But they they react just as quickly. You know they're very responsive to cash flow. So so when they see demand dropping off, they start cutting orders, cuts off the suppliers. You know and and everything starts to go bad very quickly. And then you get into this you know kind of a whipsaw type of activity where you know people are ordering more because they think they need it. You know we saw that with you know toilet paper in the U.S. You know when the, when COVID started, people order more than they need, and then that just creates more of a problem. You know in this in this constrained environment. So all of those things are a, a big deal. And, and in a constrained environment and, and things with long lead times, um, you, you know, it, it makes it much worse. And, and so we look at, well, what causes these long lead times? And a big part of that are the manual activities. And that, and that brings us back to technology. So when it takes, you know, 15 minutes to, to receive a part in the inventory, that's a big deal. You know, you say, well, 15 minutes isn't a big deal, but the problem is that 15 minute part is behind 50 other 15 minute parts. And by the time you do that, you're looking at, you know, 12 hours to receive all of the parts that you're getting in the day. And as you are doing these manual processes, and then you're at that 12 hour point or 10 hour point, you're starting to, to have more errors. And when you have errors, then the parts go from the happy path, which is 15 minutes, into the unhappy path, which is 60 to 120 minutes to receive a part. And then that just goes into a big receiving area where parts queue up, they stay there um, and, and then get you know clogged up. I mean, I've been in places where the, the the backlog, the discrepancy area looks like its own warehouse. And and then so what happens? People start to order more parts because they have their parts tied up and it just becomes a bigger and bigger, you know, bigger problem. So um so I'll jump to because uh, I'm going to run out of time on my question. <laughs> so the the integrity of the the information is really what we've got to get to. We've got to get to the point where we can transfer information electronically um, by a machine readable format, so that you know rather than receiving a part in 15 minutes, where you can receive it in two minutes. And doing that, I mean, that's just going to to push us you know so much farther ahead. Take a whole bunch of the the, the whip out of the, the whole process and 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 relieve a lot of constraints um, 
you know, in the in the supply chain. So I'll I'll stop there because I'm running out of time. <laughs> Thanks, Erky. Thank you, Pat. I think uh, both of these comments like very, very kind of spot on. So, so I guess challenges and and these are things that we can um, we can probably see also others there. Uh, but what are then the key market drivers uh, in this similar market? So, so the interesting thing, the you know the opportunities are there's a couple of them. I'm going to hit one real quickly, and and that's 3D printing. I mean, 3D printing, additive manufacturing. Um, that's a great you know jump forward for the industry. It, it takes out you know the big long lead times of uh, you know having to 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 do castings and forgings and then hogging out the metal and you know doing all that stuff. So so that's a a big jump forward. Um, but then. You know, I'll go back to 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 information flow, and, and because, you know, I, I said that's a challenge, but it's also the opportunity. You know, um, you know, investing in in technology or information is way cheaper than buying parts or buying machines and and, and all of that kind of stuff. You know, MROs have to do a lot to to make sure make sure that the you know the pedigree of the parts coming in are good, and so there's you know there's that information requirement on their part. Um, you know, and most repair shops and, you know, Ivan and several of the people on the call know this. I mean, they look more like auto repair shops than they do like aerospace things. There's, you know, the first time they hear about a part coming in is when the box arrives on the, on the dock form. Um, so the, the better thing to do is to be able to provide information electronically, you know, provide it in advance to them so that they have a good idea what's coming in. Uh, <clears throat> the problem is, Airlines don't want to do this. They don't want to invest in, um, you know, the, the effort. It goes to input, input information into a system. They just want to put the part in the box, send it off, get it off their dock, you know, and get it out to the, uh, get it out to the place. So, anyway, I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there and let Ivan, Ivan take over. Yeah, I, I think the, the key going forward is about availability, asset availability. Is it aircraft, is it engine, is it component? And and uh, in the past, or in the present, basically this has the high availability numbers have been achieved through pool of assets. Investing hugely in having three spare engines of each type or a hundred IDGs or whatever, it doesn't matter. Instead of being smarter around uh, I only need the asset when I need the asset. So do I need to hold it for then five or six years? Um, but then also when an engine, for instance, go into, goes into the shop, then you waste some time doing work scoping, but the engine is still already uh, here or you need to do an inspection. So this information that, that Patrick was speaking about, how can this be combined in a way where we know exactly what is needed? You only have the asset, the alternative asset when it's needed. There are more IDGs in the world that are needed, way more, 200% more, 300% more, uh, similarly to engines, which is, this works for the OEM because they've sold this amount more. Uh, but this reluctancy to share some of this information, uh, which is maybe something we we'll tackle about later, or the, the lack of knowledge on, on how these things can be, these things can be optimized, um, it is preventing uh, airlines to actually have the availability they need. And they are compensating that with heavy invested capital uh, in having all these assets just wasted uh, there. We've seen technology um, in the share of assets in, in very shapes and forms in different industries lately. And Airbnb, a great example, being the large hospitality supply in the world, owning zero assets or Uber, um, why cannot this happen in MRO? It's, it's, it, to, if you think about it, it's even simpler uh, um, uh, to put into, uh, to connect the some hundred airlines there are and the less MRO suppliers that there is and put everything together to share assets, to share common understanding, be able to pull all of this. And especially in the difficult times that airlines are living now with, uh, with capital being extremely scarce um, and adept being at highest levels of uh, you know history, um, this is something where they where they could play a role. Uh, but this is not a one party game, and th th there has to be some consensus that this is interesting and that this could be done. And here, technology can can uh, can, can play a huge role. You can even think about. Uh, 
the forecasting of what the what type of events are needed. So some of some of that is being done preventive maintenance. We're seeing some of that in components, but nothing, almost nothing in engines. Uh, at the same time, you could even think I'm going to have this shop visit in the next year, so I can pre-order parts. And if everyone did that, the supplier would know exactly what's the forecasted demand for the next year, and then pull all that together. Parts arrive exactly when you need them. You don't pay them in advance or anything else. You don't you don't need to wait. You strip the engine 15 days, build it back another 15 days, and back it's back in 30 days instead of now, where um, basically the supply and the demand don't meet one another, and then we're just having shops clogged with parts, uh, engines waiting 100 days for parts, and all these assets on the ground instead of flying and creating revenue for airlines. So for me, next step or one of the key drives in. future is to understand and anticipate all this demand. Perfect. Um, thanks so much. I mean, as, as airlines are now also coming out of the COVID, um, and, uh, and obviously, as you guys talked about, there are a lot of challenges. Um, what are the kind of the growth strategies or opportunities for airlines at the moment um, uh, looking forward? Airlines, in my view, are in a very, very weak position. Uh, and, 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 and we have had crises in the past affecting one areas of the world more than others. Here, I think it's one of the first crises that goes across. Um, they're highly indebted. Some of them have, have, have had capital injections from governments. Uh, investors are quite unhappy and the discount uh, share price in, in the legacy carriage in Europe is ranging 60 to 70%. Um, there's, there's a lot of sustainability pressure as well. So renew fleets, less use, less uh, carbon emissions. Also, uh, the inflation uh, doesn't support because you have high fuel pricing. At the same time, less disposable income on, um, on, uh, on passengers, so more difficulty to, uh, to sell tickets. And over and above, corporate travel is not recovered. Uh, and, and shifting from corporate traveling to leisure is hard because revenue revenue per seat is different. Uh, so airlines are, are under extreme, uh, extreme pressure. Um, I don't know if there's any growth strategy. I think uh, what, I, what I see is airlines going back to their core, uh, their core markets, uh, their core segments, and trying to survive, try to pay their debts back and try to be on, on their feet. Uh, definitely in Europe, there, there's still consolidation to be done, not so much in America. And I think the airlines in Asia will leave, uh, will have a lot of growth in front of them. But uh, Europe, uh, North America, we're city, only seeing uh, marginal growth of around 2%. So I, I would see airlines struggling actually to, to grow and more focused in, in, the, in getting the core right, getting the basics right, uh, being able to put up uh, the revenue uh, back to what it was, but still heavily depressed. And we're seeing uh, RASC 30%. Uh, below what it used to be, um, and yet capacity not not there where it was. So you. you know, if you're the if you're the CEO or CFO or chief marketing operator, you know, officer of an airline, I mean, the the place you want to spend your money, kind of like Ivan Ivan was saying, is you know the things that are going to 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 drive revenue, to to drive up stuff. So you know, whether you're spending it on you know, new lounges or you know, something that's going to attract customers. I mean, the last thing you want to do is spend money on stuff that you don't have to do. And, and that's where, you know, this, where, that's where the supply chain comes in and, and technology comes in. Because if you can avoid spending money, like Yvonne was saying about IDGs, which cost, what are they, about $250,000, depending on the airplane, <laughs> up to $500,000, you know, um, you know, you don't want to be spending money on those kind of assets if you don't have to. So, so I'm a big proponent of, you know, driving the, driving the use of pools. I mean, you know, they, when we look at it, uh, you know, the, the people who have used pools more than the, the big legacy airlines are the lower cost airlines. So, you know, why is it that a low cost airline make, thinks that it makes sense to use a pool, but a, you know, big legacy airline doesn't? And and the legacy airlines are spending a lot more money than the you know than the smaller ones are. So 
So driving, you know, the use of pools is something that I think is a, is a, is, you know, it sounds like it's a, it's a cost thing, but it's really a, a revenue opportunity thing because airlines only have so much money. And if you're spending, you know, $500 million on, on assets, you don't need to, where you could be putting that into, you know, buying airplanes or opening new destinations. Um, why don't you do that? Uh, you know, especially if you look at, you know, dry, you know, some long haul destinations where you're going to put a 787 or an A350, some very high tech, expensive airplanes. Um, you know, those are the places where other airlines are doing the same things. And they're the same airplanes. They're new airplanes. You know, they don't have a lot of history. Pools make perfect sense uh, to, to to use there. You know, we, uh, you know, the, there's the IATP pool, uh, you know, that that has been around for a long time, but that costs a lot of money because you have to put parts on, you have to take them off, you have to pay loans and borrow fees and all of that stuff. Um, so back to, you know, the, you know, what, the, how does technology play into this? I mean, technology enables pools to work a lot better. Um, you know, transferring assets from one airline to the other is way better with, with good information. So, you know, one of the things uh, I've been involved with and, you know, working with SkyThread is developing a blockchain. You know, blockchains will allow airlines to look back at the at a part for, for its whole history and know that, you know, if the part is sitting out there, I can grab that part and put it on my airplane without any issues. Where now, you know, there's a big concern about that and then it falls back into safety, engineering, all kinds of other issues that people say, well, you know what? The safe way to go is to buy an asset and own it, but that's just a you know it's a silly and expensive way of doing things. So, I think um, you know driving more pool usage, you know if, if all the airlines, I mean general aviation and business aviation have lived on pools forever and they do fine with it. So I think you know when we see the big commercial airlines doing that more, it will you know it'll it'll lower their costs and it'll free up a lot of capacity in the supply chain, you know, and, and that's what we need to be doing. So that's kind of my answer on that one. Thank you, Pat. Um, and, and just a reminder as well for everyone, if, if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to drop them, drop them to the Q&A um, section and, and we can address them also later. But as, um, as Pat, you already started out on this, um, what and how, how, um, how to effectively kind of leverage that technology uh, in this MRO supply chain. Um, even perhaps I'll, I'll hand it over to you as well. What do you see? Like what's, uh, where, where would you kind of double down on the technology side? Oh, so I'll, I'll start off with this. I, you know, when it, you know, I look back when I started with American, you know, 1985, there were, we had seven mainframe green screen terminals and 25 people using them. And, you know, I had a sign up sheet to go use them. So, so we were, you know, driving even back then, you know, Bob Crandall saw, saw that, you know, automation technology was the way to, to move forward you know, as an airline, and, and we were probably the most technologically advanced airline around, but, you know, we were doing things in COBOL and PL1, where, where now there's so many better, you know, tools available, you know, SkySelect certainly one of them, um, but you know, one of the things we used at American was, uh, you know, RPA, and there's a bunch of different, um, you know, RPA, or I'm sorry, BPA, business process automation tools uh, that, that you can use. And one of the things we did was when we removed a part from an, when we had a rotable come off a, a plane, we ran it through a process. We actually developed it to look at the forecasts, look at inventory, look at cost, look at a, a number of different factors and tell us whether we should do anything with that part. And, you know, prior to that, we had about 20 people doing that and they probably got it right you know, 90% of the time, but probably 10% of the time they didn't. And with about 250, you know, removals a day of rotables, that's 25, 25 parts that you're making a mistake on. And in a year, that's 9,000 parts. So we ended up saving probably about $4 million, you know, the first year by, by automating that process, quantifying it and managing it a hell of a lot better than we had been doing. And, and again, we took out a lot of costs we probably added another, probably saved another, you know, four or five hundred thousand dollars in soft costs, which you know, freeing up people to make decisions. Um, it cost us probably about seventy-five thousand dollars to do that. 
and and that was paying you know kind of very expensive consulting rates. So you could probably do it for half of that. But I think you know when you look at it, investing in technology and the supply chain, digitizing processes and you know, automating them, quantifying them, and again you know you, you have to digit you have to have electronic information to to do good things. Um, I'll I'll kind of close with with saying that you know what. There's a saying that, that's out there that says, if, uh, what's the best time to plant a tree? And the answer is 20 years ago. Well, what's the next best time to plant a tree today? And so th that's kind of how we are with where we are right now in this industry. We don't have enough data to do good stuff yet. There's a lot of, you know, airlines have invested a lot in decision science groups, but those people struggle because there's, no, there's not a lot of good data. So the sooner we start to jump in and quantify and collect good data, the better off we're going to be. And and like the planting a tree, the best time to do it is now. You know, if we don't do it now, we're not going to have it in 20 years from now. We're not going to have it in 10 years from now. So you know, do it. Um, as far as investing in technology in the supply chain, I, I think you get 10x back very easily. You know, so if you put $100,000 into technology, you'll get a million dollars back, and you're probably more likely, you know, going to have a, you know, a 20 times multiplier in that. So, anyway, that's that's where I'll end it. I think I don't think you can spend right now with the dearth of uh, investment there's been in technology and supply chain. I don't think you can miss it. You know, I don't think you've, <laughs> a friend said one time, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a million dollars, you know, in, in this, uh, in this industry. So I, I think that's kind of where we're at. Yeah, Thank you, Pat. I, I agree very much with this Pat said. I mean, the, the, the thing is that the amounts we're speaking about here are so large and the cost of less and less that uh, return on investment is usually, unless, even if you don't do it right, you're going to find value for sure. And there's a lot of things that can be done like on an individual basis. And, and we've launched now our, our machine learning team, artificial intelligence team to predict demand uh, based on production plans. So this engine will come from this environment, will have this work scope, and hence this is the list of parts I'm going to need. Uh, or this aircraft is going to make a six years from this customer has been flying here and there, and therefore we need this part. So basically you can have the easiest one from a financial planning perspective, but also from a supply chain planning perspective. Look, uh, supply ABC, I'm going to need this throughout the year. Please be aware, get ready. Uh, so all these things can be done and we're working on, on a lot of these, uh, a lot of learning by doing, because if you get it wrong, you still get it right, meaning you're getting value out of it. <laughs> the thing is, and, and for me, this would be the beautiful thing if we were able to all of us work in the same in the same way. Meaning, if I share my um, demand with my supplier base, it would be great they would put it somewhere, request the same from other parties, and then plan for it. Or at least because I was diligent enough to come up with my demand, at least block that for us. And this doesn't happen. Uh, I, I tend to think that this industry is, is a huge black box. And uh, um, there's, there's information everywhere, not managed. And there's a lot of reluctancy to share what you have in stock versus what you need and things like that, that is preventing us from unlocking all this value. Uh, I think if we were able even even if I were one of these large suppliers, I would even provide these as a free of charge service. It's, it's good for them to just pull all these demand uh, for them to have a better uh, planning capability, to understand the resources they need, to hire and train staff. Because today, for instance, we are, we, uh, Pat was tackling at the beginning. Uh, now there's a huge shortage of technicians engineering, uh, there's not manufacturing is, is not working where it should be. Uh, demand is over uh, is, is over capacity, and and the suppliers are trying to overcome this bubble now. But how is it going to be in 2023? Is it going to be even more than now, or is it going to be the jump from 22 demand to 23 demand even larger? And and this knowledge is not there. And I think I really honestly think that uh, the Technology can could help so much, and 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 help all parties. And I even think that, like I said, 
there should be a free of charge type of service to understand and share all the demand and the inventories and the capacity to understand when it's better to remove an engine or not. Because you, your CFM, you can recommend your airlines, look, if you're able to hold the engine one more month, your TAT will be 20 days less. It's good for everyone. It's good for the supplier. It's good for the airline. And this does, yet does not exist. And I'm not sure if we're going to be able to put all this together. But if we were, this would be beautiful. Right. Yeah, I'll just say one more comment. And I think right, right in what you were saying, Yvonne, is that, you know, back to back to pooling, you know, if 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 we were, if if the suppliers had to deal with, you know, four or five demand streams from from big poolers versus 30 or 40 demand streams from airlines that just throw parts at them, you know, as they occur, it would be a heck of a lot easier to plan capacity and, and just manage the whole supply chain. So it's, I, th I think you're right on with that. Thanks so much, uh, guys. Um, uh, I think one thing to kind of add here on my side is that I guess COVID has been, um, it's been obviously very, very hard on airlines, but I think what, what it also has been or has acted as a kind of a catalyst for the industry, for the change. I think everyone kind of realizes that this change really, really needs to happen now. And I think the, um, the like, I like your um, ex example, what you brought, Pat, that um, what's the best time of planting the tree? Well, the trees take time to grow, but if we could kind of, uh, kind of make the tree to grow instead of 10 years, like uh, in six months um, and, and kind of become big, I think that, that would be great. Uh, I know that like we would miss, that would not happen, but uh, even if we would try, I guess, to, to make those changes happen in a much shorter time frame, at the end of the day, it will benefit and kind of um, really catalyze this, uh, this kind of transformation here in this industry, which, which it really, really needs as well. Uh, because right. if we come back in 10, 10 years from now and we're still in the same place, then uh, I guess it, it won't help us. Um, it won't help anyone. <clears throat> Okay, thank you, thank you, everyone. Um, what um, what I wanted to add as well, if um, if anyone in the audience has um, any questions afterwards, um, please feel free to contact us. You you have the contacts here, and um, and yeah, the webinar will be available. Uh, we'll we'll share the link so you can you can watch it again. And if if uh, something comes up, uh, do let us know. Thanks, thanks everyone for joining, and uh, thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Pat, for for being here and and for the for the great discussion. Thanks, Turkey. My pleasure. Bye, everyone. Thank you.